most notorious modern-day financial crimes, wrapped in sophisticated cover-ups, came to the public's attention accidentally. The Ponzi schemer Bernie Madoff simulated a successful money management business that resulted in billions of dollars in losses for his clients. The scheme was not investigated until years after a whistleblower's complaints. In Canada, the Chinese forestry scandal Sinoforest cost investors $6 billion, and none of the architects of the scheme were jailed. Canadian mining scandal Brie X, colorfully captured in the movie Gold, was the story of a remarkable fraud. The company was worthless, but listed a total capitalization on the Toronto Stock Exchange of over $5 billion, duping all of the public shareholders. Well, you will see what I see, and that's money. We're talking over $30 billion. <laughs> all of those schemes could have been shut down if only the regulators had been paying attention in the early stages. Navigating a jungle, that's what's often said to investors. If you think that modern business is regulated by civilized rules of capitalism, think again. You have to give them full marks, like they're incredibly sophisticated. They had no idea that they had robbed the town of a mine. They complained about the hard rock. Well, my goodness, that's what all gold mines have is hard rock. This mine is a piece of crap. Nobody's allowed to talk about the truth. It's like a dirty little secret. Hey, we can steal millions of dollars from people. We can rob a mine from a town. But if you say anything, we'll go after you. There are just so many extremely odd things about this case. An analogy would be if we were um, in a business and we heard Don Corleone was interested in that business, um, we would probably and wisely choose to look at another business. It is bizarre. The very least that BCSC could have done is investigate the other companies. So when they sit in their offices downtown, what are they doing? Crossword puzzles? When professional Canadian investor Murray Bockholt decided to fund the Borealis mine in Nevada, the quiet period in the gold market was over. As the largest gold-producing region in the U.S. for centuries, Nevada's gold mines were an opportunity to make a profitable investment. Bockholt didn't know that the next nine years would turn out to be a nightmare. When Tony approached me, the price of gold was $1,100. We got into doing the due diligence and the math and, you know, what, how much capital was going to be required, how long was it going to take, and uh, what sort of um, IRRs could be generated from it. And, and returns and you know translate that to shareholder value you know and concluded that it was a good opportunity and I viewed it as being a great investment because it was a low risk way of participating in the restart of an existing mine that had operated before. In 2011 Griffin Gold Corporation the company he invested in on behalf of his clients began to prepare Borealis mine for full operating mode. Based on their estimates, the mine would run at roughly $20 million per year in profit. Neither the Griffin shareholders nor the board of directors were suspicious of the new CEO and CFO, James O'Neill, who was brought in to lead the mine to financial success. The moment Jim O'Neill took control of operations and joined the board, the mine began to suffer. Workers would notice that the company was not mining the high-grade ore, made unnecessary purchases of expensive earth-moving equipment, and management reported the failure of a new boiler. Greetings, and welcome to the Griffin Gold third quarter fiscal year 2013 results. The failure of our boiler impacted production and prevented us from producing gold. According to O'Neill, the mine was in urgent need of additional capital. Coincident with the new CEO's appointment, Waterton Global Resource Management, a Canadian private equity firm, appeared on the scene. O'Neill convinced the board that Waterton's financing offer could save the mine and preserve shareholder value. But the joint venture with Waterton was the best option, preserve shareholder value. What seemed to be a standard debt financing arrangement between Griffin and Waterton and the mine's salvation would be the beginning of a death spiral scheme, stripping the mine from investors. It appeared to be Marv and uh, Jim that were running the show. When O'Neill smoothly negotiated the Waterton loan, he warned the shareholders that the company was in dire straits 
and they needed to act fast. So that sent off uh, a huge alarm bell when I went to the website, all his information and contact information had suddenly disappeared. Uh, I go to Anil and he says, oh, well, I'll send him a note. Well, it took three and a half months to have a conversation with the director after multiple requests. And I go, well, this is definitely something wrong here. And he laid out why he needed $8 million in like literally two weeks. Bockhold offered financing that would preserve shareholders' interests, but this alternative was rejected. <laughs> I'd said to Anil that, look, I want an understanding between us, and I sent them an email to the board that if you need more money, don't take it from Waterton, I'll give you the money. And he gave me his word that he would not take any more money from Waterton without coming to me. That word turned out not to be worth very much. On behalf of the shareholders, Murray Bockhold began his own investigation. He discovered that the new CEO, Jim O'Neill, had also ignored other financial offers. And then it led him to a surprising discovery. That's when I hit the bullshit button. To myself, I said, that you are lying. And I arrived on the doorstep one day, unannounced. I'd, I'd really like to understand a few things about what's going on. Let's see the payables. What do the age payables look like? And they're current. And I started asking him about the boiler. It's a boiler. It's a piece of equipment. I said, what happened to it? Why did it break? It's a brand new piece of equipment. It was just installed a year ago. So, you know, at that point I go, oh, I am dealing with guys that are, that have another agenda. Suddenly, a new Waterton Griffin joint venture was announced and a 60% controlling interest was transferred to Waterton. To save Griffin's remaining 40% interest in the Borealis mine, Bockhold forced the Griffin board to file for bankruptcy. He was sure, once bankruptcy hearings took place, that the court would uncover all discrepancies in mismanagement and protect shareholders from the orchestrated dilution. He was wrong. Waterton management convinced the court that the mine was uneconomic and would not recover from bankruptcy. The judge handed the keys of the mine to Waterton, and the shareholders were left with nothing. Well, I felt like totally dejected. Uh, you know, it was a very bleak phase of it. I thought it would be so easy. Are you kidding? I thought this was a slam dunk. The mine, which he believed was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, was out of reach. But as luck would have it, this was the very moment when one of Griffin Gold's shareholders, devastated by the bankruptcy court decision, happened to meet an ex-Borealis employee, Glenn Kyle. I was hoping to see something out of it, but instead I had to work for the company that stole my shares, stole my money, and I was threatened with jail. I was threatened with all kinds of things, so I really didn't have much of a choice. After Waterton laid Kyle off, he began working at the local bar in Hawthorne. Glenn had invested his own money in Borealis and believed it to be a successful business. He knew of Waterton's manipulations, but for a long time kept those secrets to himself. The first thing that I noticed, being there through me being there through the drilling process and knowing where the better ore was, there was times when uh, we'd run nothing but crap. I mean, there was no excuse for it. But their plan was to take the mine. Now, they knew there was $32 million in the pond already, which would have paid all the bill off for Griffin Gold. They knew where we would have got the decent ore, but they wouldn't allow us to do that. So they kept the mine running, and they let it fail. That way they could say, well, this was a total loss. Glenn Kyle witnessed how new Waterton management executed a plan to hide the gold in the pond by filling it with carbon. To do this, they went against conventional methods of gold processing because it would suppress the gold mine's profit numbers during bankruptcy. And as soon as I realized what was going on, I took samples. The last time we sampled it, and me and a couple of the guys in the ADR plant considered the fact that there was probably over $50 million by then in the pond. Hester was mad because as far as he was concerned, it needed to fail. We were getting far too much gold. It was profitable. We were making too much money. Kyle was the first employee who came forward with his statement under oath. The next who broke his silence was a certified geologist with 43 years of mining experience, Steve Craig. He was a mining exploration expert in Nevada and supervised the Borealis mine for 14 years. When Waterton was operating at the mine, they were processing old waste dumps and 
old bleached pad material. Those particular grades were fairly low. They didn't want to mine hard rock because I believe that they wanted to preserve it for later. They were also saying that they were not getting enough gold. Uh, but I believed, after talking with uh, Glenn Kyle, that they were hiding the gold and the carbon in the pond in plain view. And uh, at one point, I flew over the property in a, in a small plane that I chartered out of Reno, and that pond was black black, whereas the other pond wasn't. That was full of clean water, and they were hiding, hiding information. Uh, it's, after a while, I thought that they were extremely paranoid and very careful. More than a dozen former workers, consultants, and experts came forward one by one to reveal the truth. Once this truth became public, Waterton started laying off all the mine workers. Some of them asked that their faces be blurred and their voices changed. In that small Nevada town, they still feel threatened by the power of a mining giant. It was really weird the way I was terminated. I was called down to a hotel room where Jack and Randy both met with me and me signed a letter. But the exact reason was, um, at the time, I was being accused of stealing from the mine, I guess you can say. The Sheriff's Department said that they were gonna send it off, have it all tested. They declared it was not from Borealis. I work seven days a week. I built the place. I did everything. There was no, no excuse, no rhyme or reason to get rid of me. They said if I said anything outside of hello and I have to go, that I would end up in a jail cell somewhere. So Jack, it's normal operations that this can be pumped out and pumped into the overflow pond, right? And or pumped back up onto the pad, is that right? Is on the... Yeah. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that that's not part of this discussion today. Murray Buckholt never imagined himself as an investigator of any kind, despite his love for Robert Ludlum thrillers. However, the whistleblower's stories armed him with new facts and confidence. He would not only publish this evidence on his firm's website, but seek further support from media and regulators. His discovery showed how Waterton conspired to hide the true state of affairs at the mine. So when we caught them doing that, we got the court to agree to pull all that carbon out. So I was, I actually went to the site a couple of weeks before it was to be pulled out to visually see it. And I walked around in the pond and sure enough, there was four feet of carbon, the size of half a football field. Griffin launched a $300 million civil suit against Waterton in 2018. When the court granted Bockhold access to inspect the drained pond, it was immediately obvious that carbon finds containing gold were present. This supported the testimony of Borealis workers. An estimated value of at least $35 million in gold was hidden in plain sight, right in the pond. He filmed what he could, but to really prove it without a doubt, that was the next step for Bockhold. So there are carbon and carbon fines in here, as we suspected. When the judge forced Waterton to allow testing of the content from one of the ponds constantly filling with carbon, most of the bags tested, 440 tons worth, were found to be contaminated with mercury. And then once again, you can see all the leakage all the way down there. The highly toxic shipment could not be accepted for refining. Bockhold was convinced Waterton had sabotaged the testing because the pond was perfectly dry when he was standing in it a few weeks prior. They laced them with mercury contaminated water and then they shipped them 125 miles to Sparks, leaking mercury all over the state. They arrive at the refiner. The refiner does his vapor tests. Way too much mercury here. We can't refine them. Send them back. Well, perfect. It's a great way to cover it up because when they send them back, Fortunately, our whistleblowers were the people that were told to, oh, these bags go put in front of the surveillance camera. These bags over here with all the gold in them, just go dig a big pit up in the top of the, of the heap leach pad and bury them in there. And we won't tell anybody. And nobody will know, including the judge. Eventually, based on witness testimony, when the bags were returned, they hid the evidence of bags laced with gold and claimed there was no significant amount of gold in the pond. Around early May 2017, Waterton started to be very secretive. 
They kept information away from the operators. We had considerable supplies and Waterton did not want us to do our maximum effort for covering the top of the pond with leech lines. It seemed that they were trying to limit the mine's effort to produce gold as quickly as possible. During Griffin's inspection of the Borealis mine in 2018, I and Jesse Brankley was instructed by Jack McMahon to hide the boat, which was kept at the Borealis mine. I was also aware that the leach pad contains substantial amount of carbon fines. I heard that the super sacks were so water laden that truck drivers had to stop en route to resecure the load. Numerous sacks were not water laden, so it means they contained carbon with gold, and they went to the side of the leach pad. Ian dug the hole with the backhoe of the mine and placed the sacks into the hole. Additionally, sludge which Rennie hasn't had us move from the pond was also buried in the same area up by the leach pad. While working on the Borealis mine case with his lawyers, Bockholt had access to independent investigations from many experts, including Price Waterhouse Coopers. Their findings alerted Bockholt to more complicated schemes of financial manipulation. The key things in the Griffin story are three things. One was usurious rates of interest. So those are the rates of interest in the loans that Waterton or that Griffin undertook to accept from Waterton. So all these rates all break the Criminal Code of Canada. Then, another damning discovery. A public record stating that the mine paid $3.6 million in Nevada state taxes on $72 million in gross profit in the same year that the company was labeled by Waterton as unprofitable and uneconomical. So this became a very key thing for us to focus on during the proceedings was, A, was that actually ever made by the mine? None of us believed it could actually be made by the mine. It didn't believe it had the capability of being that profitable. Uh, B, if it was made by the mine, then that automatically meant that Griffin should emerge from bankruptcy. The other thing that happened at the exact same time is Waterton Global Value One sold a series of assets, a series of mines, to Waterton Precious Metals Fund Two. And this was marketed to investors by Hamilton Lane and Atlantic Pacific. And this attracted $2.1 billion of investment. So our theory is <clears throat> this is a completely fictitious number that was made up and posted so that Waterton could go to these investors and say, hey, we did this deal in Waterton Global Value where we swapped $23 million of loans for the Borealis mine. Public investors didn't understand it. This mine made $72 million in its first year of operation. In the private equity world, you know, valuations range from five to eight to 10 times uh, EBITDA, we call it, or cash flow. Not quite the same words, but close enough. So that is a value in the range of 350 to 730 million for that asset. So fund two investors paid some number. I don't know what the number is, but let's just take the low end of the range, five times earnings. That's $350 million for an asset that they paid $23 million for. So these investors made out like bandits. They made like a 16 times return on their investment in the space of a year. But what this opens up is that what on the surface appears to be a bankruptcy fraud around one mine in Nevada is actually a fraud that encompasses uh, allegedly, you know, fraudulent treatment of $2.1 billion of public capital that's been invested, that's been invested in a, in a and basically, this is like um, Canada's version of Bernie Madoff. Uh, it's a version of a Ponzi scheme. The fund, these investors are putting money in to give to these investors. Phase two, three is gonna be, how do these guys get paid? Financial forensic experts uncovered that Waterton hadn't loaned the amounts claimed. Three million dollars had been double counted. And the key thing that they've identified is that Waterton uh, double counted uh, $3 million of uh, what was originally a $4.6 million advance, and they counted it twice. 
So in fact, they're, they, they claim that there was um, something like $27 million of money lent, but in fact, there was only $23 million. The more Murray Bockholt dug into the financial intricacies of the prominent bargain hunter, the more resistance he would meet. I think the PwC report was from very reputable uh, company, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and what they showed was perhaps uh, the tip of the iceberg about what appeared to be irregular accounting. In a perfect world, uh, we would have gone farther with the PwC and looking at more records. And the records they did look at were produced under seal by Waterton. And at every stage, uh, even though the PwC report uh, had revealed very little about any, anything possibly secret, Judge Zive uh, is a very good bankruptcy judge, carries a good reputation. And so it was um, surprising to us that he would keep it under seal, even though we tried to, to get it out from under seal several times. When neither the bankruptcy proceedings nor the civil courts granted Griffin the right to subpoena Waterton, Bockhold and his lawyers kept digging deeper. Despite labeling the Borealis mine a piece of crap, Waterton applied for permits to restart mining operations of fresh ore. Bockhold would come to see that Waterton, an experienced financial predator, would come up with all sorts of cover-up tactics and was willing to spend big money on the team of lawyers working against him. I would say Waterton tried to prevent us from getting information. We never have seen the record of negotiations how the Griffin directors gave up 60% of the mine uh, and basically gave up the mine. Griffin had put all of its records on a cloud server in Canada and then they stopped paying the cloud server and after whatever warnings or cautions are required by law that if you don't pay your bill, you know, we're going to use the server for something else and your record's going to be lost. They didn't try to retrieve the records. Uh, they didn't pay the bill, which was not that big. And so the Griffin corporate records were lost. Along with the Waterton strategy of threatening employees, they sued Bockhold for defamation. No matter how many times he invited Waterton management to answer his questions, all he got was rejection. When he visited the Elko mining office in Reno, Waterton lawyers responded with the filing of a restraining order, even if all he was doing was speaking through a closed door. You have to close the door. Okay. Okay. Just a few weeks later, returning from work on this documentary, Bockhold found his car vandalized in a parking lot. Despite the massive gaping holes smashed through the car windows, nothing valuable had been stolen. This is an incredibly intelligent designed business model because there are so many facets to it where they have figured out how to use the system, loopholes in the system, disguising uh, misinformation, uh, having somebody think one thing when in fact it's the exact opposite. Did you have a current or a previous relationship with Waterton before joining Griffin? I we we did a transaction with him in a in a uh, uh, prior company I was with uh, the Florida Canyon mine owned by Japangu International. So that answer would be yes. You did have a previous relationship with Waterton. Yes. Okay. You know, this sounds like collusion to me because, quite frankly, when you have a previous relationship with a company that's taking over a company that you are managing or mismanaging, I have a problem with that. The whole financing deal rather unworkable, and therefore our shares are going to get done. There's a lot of questions, but quite frankly, I smell a rat. And how much are you getting paid by Waterton to do this deal? Pardon? What's going in your pocket? Uh, that's, that's inappropriate. It wasn't an accident that the downfall of Griffin Gold in 2012 began with a newly appointed CEO, James O'Neill. He promised to protect investors' interests. However, by signing the Waterton contract, Griffin and shareholders would lose their ownership position by default. Back then, none of the shareholders sensed the pitfalls, hiding behind O'Neill's smooth tone. We believe this agreement not only strengthens Griffin today, but in the long run will more quickly realize the full potential that the Borealis property has to offer. Bockhold probed O'Neill's professional career, revealing O'Neill's ties to Waterton. He uncovered a network of people who worked for mining companies, consultants, and experts that had undisclosed ties to Waterton. 
Once I pieced together the Jim O'Neill and Marv Kaiser aspect, and then I, I learned through Klondex what had gone on at Klondex, you know, then it became, oh, I should actually start paying attention to all the various places that Waterton's loan money and just see what goes on there. And, and that's when we developed this whole bigger business model. And this is where their, mod, their business model's phenomenal. So they've shorted the stock, they go in, and of course they tell you and they want you to believe that they're just a loan to own lender. Nothing illegal about loan to own. What's not legal is having people inside the company act on your interest at the exclusion of the other shareholders or the other creditors or the other public. So that's where we uncovered that, oh, there is this model where they actually infiltrate the companies and boards. It appeared that more than 14 public companies had suffered the same pattern of borrowing money, losing their market value, and eventually ending up at the mercy of Isher Elishis. He estimated that Waterton's maneuvers resulted in more than 450 million of lost value in public shareholder equity. What we see in this, this screen, or this, um, we call it the Waterton Network, this really represents uh, the core companies that we've got the actual evidence around. And what, what it demonstrates is the, the movement of these people in their network, all undisclosed to uh, the company and other board members, all undisclosed to uh, the public. So let's take a specific example of Don Sherburn, who showed up at Griffin uh, as an operations guy. Bockold then followed the sequence of events at Scorpio Gold Corporation. The music and the dancers were painfully familiar. Don Shabrin, former COO of Griffin, was involved with Scorpio Gold, another mining company to which Waterton offered to help with a $6 million loan. Neither Shabrin nor Waterton disclosed their relationship to Scorpio. Well, Don Sherburn also surfaces over here in Japangu in the Florida Canyon mine and Standard, uh, Standard Gold. Well, interestingly, Don Sherburn also appeared more recently at Scorpio. Don Sherburn was a consultant at Mine Technical Services. My, that gave him access to all kinds of mines across the state of Nevada. Those resource calculations were not disclosed to the public. They were twice the value of what had been disclosed to, um, to the public. So isn't it interesting that this one guy who has surfaced at multiple companies resurfaces again, completely undisclosed interest to the directors, the board, and the shareholders. David Laniato, an investor with 38 years of experience, was sure that investing in the Borealis mine would be a great opportunity. He did his due diligence estimating the profitability of the mine. What he missed was identifying the real players behind the scenes. After a while, we started to, what, what is Waterton? The day the loan was signed, the day that agreement was signed, it was basically uh, the kiss of death. The Waterton CEO, Isher Alicious, had his brilliant death spiral loans tactics featured in Forbes and the New York Times. But there has been little revealed about what actually happened in those deals. How could a gold mining company valued in the hundreds of millions of dollars abruptly suffer such huge financial losses while managed by Waterton? Came up with 16 companies that Waterton had been involved in. And uh, I did a spreadsheet and we looked at their values pre-Waterton involvement uh, post-Waterton involvement, and um, the majority of the companies, basically the majority of the shareholder uh, equity was wiped out for the in investors who had been involved prior to Waterton's involvement. David Laniano started an investigation as well. He was confident it would be easy to present the evidence to authorities and force Waterton to answer any questions. However, after losing in bankruptcy court and after unsuccessful attempts to gain attention from regulators, he too was proven wrong. Waterton is very good at what they do. Key component to their business model is um, non-disclosure agreements and uh, vigorously pursuing anybody who steps out of line, including the courts, including uh, shareholders. Waterton created a perfect business model for sure, but I think they're just they're one of many who have realized that the reward far outweighs the risk. Worst case, they'll get a slap on the hand, but to even get to the point where they can even be in danger of getting a slap on the hand is so remote. They know, they know that. They know that securities commissions have very little 
uh, bite. A shareholder of Borealis Mine for many years, David Lloyd also tried to get answers from regulators. He's ahead of the BIM Committee, the organization that represents BIM clients and was created to present what happened in the loan-to-own cases to regulatory authorities. He believes that the shareholders of the 14 public companies, tens of thousands of individual investors, deserve a legitimate investigative response from the regulators. Uh, the net result is that uh, shareholders, Canadian citizens, have had the value of their investment stripped. We should at least have um, some authority looking into this and giving us um, an explanation of what, this, uh, what happened, why it happened, who was involved, but uh, we have just been stonewalled in terms of our appeals to these various um, organizations. You look at the Canadian regulatory system and the fact that it's fragmented among the, the 10 provinces and the territories, and it's like they're competing against each other for uh, the favor of investment capital. It's almost a Wild West gloves off environment. And the, the crimes that do get po prosecuted, uh, there it doesn't seem to be uh, any teeth. The, the penalties seem to be quite small. Uh, you hear about the penalties. And you th think as an investor in Canada, buyer beware. Sometimes you wake up and wonder, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we are supposed to get ripped off. And, uh, because nobody seems to care. Uh, getting back to British Columbia, you know, and I've written complaints to them. They'll acknowledge the complaints and then they, and they come out and say, you'll never hear from us again. Like, what kind of evidence-based system is that? They haven't investigated Griffin. They've actually gone out of their way to not investigate Griffin. It's almost, one would almost think that they're complicit with the organization that has been destroying shareholders' values. I mean, it is bizarre. Compare it to a murder scene. So the police arrive, there's two bodies, both been shot. And then if it was run by BCSC, no, nah, we're not gonna investigate that. Huge corporation with vast resources, not only just financial resources, but network resources, people, networks. Um, there's a lot of people that would have a lot to lose, a lot of people that would want to protect their interest. Conflicts of interest are rampant in this story, rampant. They are all over the place. They're at CIBC, they're at Waterton, they're at um, uh, the Silver State Opportunity Fund, an investor. Classic case of conflict of interest. They've invested in it, they're supporting the, the Nevada economy, Here's this guy that's done all these crazy things to all these, these companies, stolen all these assets from them, harmed many of these people, they've lost their job, and yet these guys are advertised as being the guys that are providing all this economic wealth to the state of Nevada. Nine years of court battles, an ongoing defamation case, an exhausting private investigation. At this point for Bockhold, it's all about justice. Waterton's done this great job of portraying me as being some sort of crazy. It's nine years. You know, you're crazy. Like, and I go, well, if I'm crazy, then there's a lot of other people that are crazy too. You know, these people, they're just like me. They, they go, what? How much evidence do we have to give? How much harm do we have to demonstrate? You know, this is now, the order of magnitude of this story is there's actually four billion dollars of capital that's at risk. I'm not saying four billion dollars has been stolen, I'm saying there's four billion dollars of capital that is at risk of somebody believing one thing and the truth being something else. The Borealis story is just one of many. Unscrupulous hedge fund bottom feeders prey on hard rock mining companies when they're at their most vulnerable. Individual investors and longtime employees are the victims. In this fight, shareholders are losing to powerful financial predators. Is there an institution willing to protect minor investors or trusting workers before mega millions in hard-earned retirement funds are siphoned off to the Cayman Islands and beyond? And the only question I'm left with is, how did $17 billion 
disappear overnight. They never knew Murray was such a bastard that he would <laughs> keep fighting them this long. <laughs> well, some things you just gotta stand for, right? So. Murray Bockhold and the BIM Committee have had an ongoing dialogue with the BC Securities Commission, the Ontario Securities Commission, and IMET, including numerous presentations. None of the regulators claim to have jurisdiction to initiate an investigation. This led to inquiries with IROC, the RCMP, the Ontario Police, and the Vancouver Police, many of whom have not even had the courtesy to reply, despite the fact that the loans were made between Canadian companies governed by Canadian law and were in breach of the usurious lending laws of the Criminal Code of Canada. And none of the witnesses, including Bockhold, have been interviewed by a Canadian regulator or the police. Bockhold and the BIM Committee have also reached out to other participants, including CIBC, Hamilton Lane, Richardson GMP, Atlantic Pacific, and the Silver State Opportunity Fund. In spite of their involvement, all of them declined to offer assistance.